Be turning to Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13. Thankful to be in the service again tonight. We're thankful to see each one that's here. Romans chapter 13 is where we'll read from. While you're finding your place, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day and for the blessings of it, Lord. I thank you for the many things that you've done for us, the blessings of life that you've given us, Lord. I pray you would help me here tonight, Lord. You know what I stand in need of. and Lord, I pray that you'd help me to know exactly, Lord, what I need to say. and keep, Lord, help me keep from saying the things I shouldn't. I pray you'd bless the church and each one that's here. Pray, Lord, for the requests that were mentioned. Lord, those that are on our prayer list, I pray you'd bless each one. I pray, Lord, for those that are lost, that they could see their need of Jesus while there's time and opportunity. I pray again, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 13. Now, before we begin, let's go back for a moment and remember uh, kind of where we uh, where we've been, it's so important, especially to go back and remember chapter 12. Uh, Paul has, of course, let us know that the only way that we could be saved or sanctified is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, that everything that God has done and throughout uh, this plan that God has uh, is that he has concluded that all men are in unbelief and through his plan, he's concluded that or shown that basically that the world could see that all men are in unbelief. And the reason for that is so that God could have mercy upon all men through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is God's desire. And he goes on in chapter 12 to say, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you by God's mercy and all that he's done for us that what we are to do is to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What does God reasonably expect for us to present ourselves a sacrifice? What we're talking about and what we're going to continue to talk about, this is what God reasonably expects from us. This is our reasonable service. Verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so last time we discussed the idea of uh, having a transformed mind and specifically concerning the things in chapter 12. In other words, that Paul now begins to, he doesn't just not just say that we need to be transformed at mind and go on and close the book, but he tells us you need to be transformed in this type of way of thinking. In other words, we need to be transformed in our mind about how we view ourselves. We need to be transformed in our mind about how we view the church. We need to be transformed in mind how we view our brothers and how we treat our brothers. Uh, we need to be transformed as far as our enemies go. And then in chapter 13, the, the very idea continues that we still need to be transformed in mind. We need our minds transformed about the way we see certain things, the way we uh, look at as we see in chapter 13 we're going to go into. Uh, two or three different other ideas. So he begins in verse 1 of chapter 13, and he says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but God, and the powers that be ordained are, are excuse me, the powers that be are ordained of God. And so when the idea of higher powers here, or the idea is, is the idea of rulers or magistrates, people that are in office people that are in positions of authority, uh, specifically kings. I mean, yeah, we've got local governments. We've got uh, lots of positions through here. But uh, you, you look at the ideas of, of kings, and, and uh, it's going to be kind of the first thing that comes to our mind. And uh, so often we get to the place that we, and maybe we don't like who it is that's in office, or maybe we disagree with their uh, mode or train of thinking. We disagree with their policies. We disagree with their beliefs concerning different things. And so often we, you know, but what, do we, what do we do in the situation? How are we supposed to react as God's people? And what he's saying is that what we, we need to be transformed in our minds about how we view. And, and one of the reasons is 
or in fact, the very reason is that we need to think differently concerning the higher powers is because there is no power but of God. In other words, the only reason that these people who are in office are in office at all is because God has allowed them to be there. God is the one that has put them in this position. And so sometimes we may uh, get a little bit uh, to the place where we don't like who's there and we, you know, maybe have a little pity party or throw us a little temper tantrum about it and get upset concerning these things about uh, the, these political uh, things or people that are in uh, office and that kind of idea. And uh, I, I just want you to notice this. Look at verse 2. He says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, in other words, whoever fights against uh, this thing, or if you're going to lash out with our tongue and lash out with our mouth about this and, and about these people that's in power and they should never be there and it's, it's a bunch of garbage and this kind of thing and, and all of that, what you're really doing is you're lashing out against God. Now, now notice this. He that, he, whosoever therefore that resisteth the, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. In other words, you're resisting the very thing that God has ordained to be. Because God has put these powers in place. And God has set it up the way as it pleased Him. No one else is in control. No one else here is, is in the place. It, is there who, who really decides the elections? What well, God does. That's who, God is the one who puts people in power. The Scripture says He takes the heart of kings, not only when he, they're in power, but He sets them up and He takes them down. Also, the Scripture says that He takes the heart of kings to turn them whithersoever He listeth. In other words, He can take and do with them whatever He sees fit. God can, uh, can, can accomplish through them whatever that He needs to accomplish. And so He has reason and He has purpose in that. I think about the, when I think about this, there's two kings that come to mind immediately two men in, in, men in history uh, who were in power, in places of power, and yet had very different outcomes. They had uh, very similar beginnings, but very different outcomes. And yet God put both of them in their place for a reason, and I think it's more clearly seen with these two than anyone else. I'll give it to us. And those two men are Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh. And I think it's clearly seen that God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be in power at that specific time. And Nebuchadnezzar even was so arrogant in, the, uh, in, in his reign as king over Babylon. And, and by the way, there was in all the empires, in all the empires since Babylon, there has never been a king as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar was. Most of these authorities were set up with some sort of checks and balances. And the more that this goes forward, the more that's the case. You see, uh, even the Medo Persian Empire, which would follow, they had a sort of check and a balance. And you can see that as Darius would make a decree. And it was ruled that once a king made a decree, that he could not back out on that decree. And he had a a, a, an authority, a group of people who could come back on him if he did that. Nebuchadnezzar didn't have any of that. Nebuchadnezzar was in complete control. And whatever he said went. And so the Scripture bears that out. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, then he, he realized that. He knew that. And as he come to chapter 3, and he was going to three, throw the three Hebrew children into the fiery furnace, he said, who is it? Who is this God that is able to deliver you out of my hand. And so Nebuchadnezzar would uh, rise up against God and, and, and even to, to claim that he was the, the, the highest one of authority and nobody above him. And yet in chapter 4, he says that he recognized the Most High. It's amazing to me to hear him speak in chapter 3 and then to hear him speak in chapter 4. You're talking about a different man. In chapter, the beginning of chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is speaking, looking back on what took place. And so he says that he recognized 
the Most High. I believe Nebuchadnezzar got saved, and I believe Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh were very similar in minded in the beginning parts of their reigns. But Nebuchadnezzar recognized the Most High God. Pharaoh did not. And yet God got glory from both of their lives. And God had a purpose for both of them being there. That doesn't mean that God made them do anything. That doesn't mean God, let me say it this way, God took their choice away from them. But God is so superior and so far above us that we can have free will and we still can't mess up his plan. It's amazing to me. He can give Pharaoh his choice, and, and, and Pharaoh can do whatever he sees fit, and he still can't mess up God's plan. And Pharaoh, the Scripture says that there, God raises up some men to, as the vessels of honor and some to dishonor. But the, the thing is, we get to decide whether we're a vessel of honor or dishonor to the Lord. So we need to think differently concerning our higher powers. We, we, rather, the, the men who are in power, we should think differently concerning politics and concerning the rulers that be and concern, concerning the government. We need to think differently and we need to have our mind transformed about that. We need to leave the natural way of thinking of things and turn to a more spiritual mindset is what he's showing us here. And specifically, the reason for that it's because God is the one who's done it. As you see in the end of chapter 1, he says, For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. In other words, God's the one put them in power. And so the reason that we need to think different is because we need to remember God's place in all of this. And that he's the one in control here. Verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror of, uh, to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? You're not going to be afraid, kind of fear their power, if you will, knowing that God put them in control and not knowing exactly why it could be the case that God put them there. He says, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. I want to read another verse to you. If you'll turn here, turn to, uh, kind of mark your place here if you see fit, turn to First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy 2, Paul addresses this same issue with Timothy somewhat that I think we need to look back at because I think Timothy, or, or rather Paul gives Timothy something here that we need to be aware of as we're looking at this topic. 1 Timothy 2. Peter, by the way, while you're turning, Peter says a similar statement. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17 he says, honor the king. We are to honor the king. A familiar verse, I know you're probably all aware of that. But Peter tells us that what we need to do is honor the king. Here, he tells Timothy, he says, I exhort you therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Now, I want to stop there for a moment. He's telling us, and Timothy as well, that we need to be in prayer for those that are in authority. We need to be praying for those who have the rule over us, who are rulers and are magistrates over us that are in those powers. And there is something to do with how we pray. Let me ask us this. As we pray, as we uh, concern ourselves with the issues of politics and of government, what is the most important issue that we always look at? I think probably the most important one that we all agree on is that our freedom of worship could be preserved. That we could maintain the freedom to be able to worship and, and, and congregate ourselves as a body in public. And so he's telling us here that what we need to do is that we need to pray for these kings and for all that are in authority. Notice this, that we may, in other words, that, 
this is so that we so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, it, the Scripture helps us understand that there is something to do with our praying and how we treat our rulers in authority that has to do with us living a quiet and peaceable life. And so, we, first, I think it's important that we ask ourselves the question, are we doing this now? When it comes to the idea of politics and men going into authority that, that we may not necessarily like or agree with, are we praying for them? And I'm not talking about the little bumper sticker that talks about the verse from Psalm that tells us that basically the best thing to do is get him out of office. And I'm not talking about that because it's often, if it is prayed, prayed in the wrong spirit. And that we truly need to be in prayer for these men. Because God put them in power. And what our, really our concern is, is we're looking to the government to do the things that God can only do. I want you to hear me. Do you know that if our freedom of worship is preserved, it's because God preserved it? Monday was Memorial Day. I thank the Lord for every man who's given his life for this country. I'm thankful, and don't, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to tell you. But the reason that America is still a free country is because God has allowed it. First and foremost. And we've got to be able to see things from that perspective and in that priority, yes, those men gave their lives, and I'm thankful for it. And yes, they gave their lives to protect us and our, fra our flag and our freedoms and, and all of that. But had God not willed it to be so, it would have been in vain. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, God is in control of what takes place. And so rather than looking at our leaders to preserve these things, we need to look to our Lord and our God and pray to Him for our leaders that our, things, that, that, that our freedoms could be preserved. You know, it could very quickly be the case that a lot of things in this life could change very quickly and very drastically. And our freedoms not be here anymore. And we need to... Uh, at the end of the day, what I'm praying for is that we could live a quiet and peaceable life. That we could stay, we could serve the Lord, try to raise our family as it would please God and teach them the Bible and teach them the Word of God and give them a Christian education first and foremost. And that we could protect our freedoms, the Lord would, so that we could live a quiet and peaceable life. And so we need to be in prayer for these men that lead our nation. We need to be in prayer for them for our own sakes that we could live a quiet and peaceable life. Not throwing little fits and temper tantrums and, you know, not talking trash about these men in, in office and all of these for the respect of the office's sake and, and furthermore for the respect of the Lord's sake. Because he's the one that's put them there. And he's the reason that they're in office. Okay, going back to Romans 13. He says in verse 4. While you're turning, you know, we often... He says here that for he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if, thou, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God to revenge, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now digest that verse for a moment. And when you look at America, and when you look at our president, We've about got the one we deserve, don't we? 
God sets them up to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. Well, that about puts us in our place, doesn't it? And so when we, when we rebel against that, what we're really doing is we're rebelling against the Lord and we need to be praying to God rather than, than running them down, praying to God and lifting them up that, that we could live a, a quiet and peaceable life. And so these men have been put in power that, that, they, could, uh, that they could bring and, and do God's will in this place. Whether they, and this is amazing to me, whether they know it or not, they are a minister of God. In other words, they've been put in this and allowed in this position to, of authority to accomplish God's will. So from that perspective... It could be the case that God's allowed the president that we have that we could draw closer to Him. And that we could see our need of Him and, and draw back to Him. And if we did that, we might could have one uh, of a different stature. I believe this is to God's people as well. That we need to be careful about, uh, about these things. That we need to... Uh, conduct ourselves properly, that we could have a good leader. That we wouldn't be a, a nation in deserving of wrath that God would get. So we need to grow spiritually concerning that. The point is this. Did we pray more under Trump's administration or Obama's? Or Biden? You know, if we're not careful, we can get Trump in office or somebody we like. And just, you know, well, everything ain't going to be good now for a while, you know, and just kind of back off on it. But God's still in control. God was in control of all three of them. And all three of them accomplished exactly what God had set them forth to accomplish. And so what he's telling us is that we need to think differently concerning these authorities. God is in full control concerning their positions. Verse 5, he says, Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for also for conscience sake. We need to be careful concerning these things. Verse 6, he goes a little bit further with this idea. Verse 6, listen to me for just a moment. You may not like it, but it's Scripture. Verse 6 says, For this cause pay ye tribute also. Tribute is taxes. Tribute is taxes. And so, yes, the Bible tells you to pay your taxes. Don't lie. Last time I checked, that's not right either, is it? No, lying's wrong, so we're not to lie. And this, all of this takes a great degree, I believe, of faith. That we have to remember God's position, all of this. We've got to remember that, that God is the one in control. We have to remember that the end of the year, that if we write down everything that we've truly made within the best of our ability, the reason that we've made that much is because that's what God has chosen to give us. And if we pay taxes on that amount, it may be a good amount, but God's given us what we have, and God can give us more if He sees fit to take care of it. There was a time, you remember, when, when uh, Peter uh, was con very concerned about their ability to pay taxes to the Roman government. There are quite a few questions in the Gospels concerning tribute. In fact, they tried to, to hang Jesus up about whether or not that men should pay tribute. And they were going to catch 22, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if he told the Israelites not to pay taxes, then they were going to go to the Roman government. And if he told them to pay taxes, then they were going to tell the people, see, he's in support of the Roman government. And then he would lose his popularity. But Jesus, in so great and wise fashion, got the coin... He saw the inscription on it, which is interesting. But he said, whose inscription is this? And it was Tiberius Caesar. And he said, you render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. 
that you render unto God the things that are God's. And what he was talking about right there is that coin has been inscribed with Caesar's picture on it, Tiberius. That's all he can do is inscribe a coin. That's the only image he's got. But your bodies are marked with the image of God. You give that coin back to Caesar, but you give your bodies to God. So, yeah, the, the Bible tells us that we need to pay our taxes and not lie. So, Peter was worried and very concerned one day about being able, there, being able to pay theirs. And Jesus told him, he said, go fishing. Catch a fish. And when you catch that fish, open his mouth, look in his mouth, get the coin out of it, and go pay taxes for both of us. And that's exactly what Peter did. Now, if Jesus can pay their taxes and Peter's taxes by Peter going fishing, I think he can take care of mine, and he can take care of ours. So the Scripture tells us to be honest concerning our taxes. Pay them. Pay what's due to us. And I'm going to tell you another thing. It's a relief when you get to the end of the year and you don't have to worry about the IRS auditing you. <laughs> Pay them what you do. You don't have to worry about that. So he says, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers. And I'll read that again. For they are God's ministers. That doesn't mean that they're preachers. or any, they're, The word minister here is, of course, a servant, that they're God's servant, whether they know it or not. That God is using them, attending continually up on this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything. I believe what he's meaning here, kind of changing the idea for a moment. I don't believe it's just random debt that he's talking about. The owe no man anything. Although the Bible has quite a bit to say about debt, concerning debt. But he, he's not speaking specifically of debt here, but rather concerning the taxes and the things that are owed to the rulers and the men who are in power, that we need to deliver those things from, to them and not be in any debt uh, to them. Now, we are to be, and, and remember, custom to custom, tribute to tribute, fear to fear, honor to honor. We are to, in every way, obey them and obey the law unless... Unless they tell us to do something against what the Scripture says. That's very important. If the Bible ever tells us to do something, the Bible trumps any other man's word. One of the things I heard so much when COVID hit is that we need to honor the men. They use this Scripture. We need to obey the laws of the land. No, we need to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. That trumps this. Okay, and so he, he changes ideas in verse 8 from, from the ideas of, of the ruling powers and the ideas of uh, the governments to that of our neighbors then. And so how, are, how is it that we are to think concerning our neighbors? He says, but then to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And uh, really, it's, when you, when you, you know, look at how to treat your neighbor uh, the love is the way Jesus makes a very similar statement concerning uh, being neighborly. And the man asked him who his neighbor was. Jesus gave him the parable of the Good Samaritan there. And so it's, it's the compassion and the love. We can be assured as God's people. Now when you talk about love here, it's important to note that he's not talking about some kind of uh, strange love or some kind of something of that nature or some kind of brotherly love or family love that's almost automatic. He's talking about a godly love of agape, one that is, uh, you, you know, what, that, the kind of love where you can love somebody but not like them. Y'all understand what I mean by that? That, that's what he's talking about. And so love should, in cases of how we to treat one another, uh, this doesn't just work with our neighbors. It works, uh, it's good for the church. It's good for all of us concerning one another. We're to let love be our guide. So instead, what, what, what does, uh, what does how, how should we treat them that we, then, that we love them, you know, knowing that we love them. If maybe they've talked ugly about us, but we don't hate them for it. We love them. And so what should we do that, that we, now that we love them and from the perspective of love, I guess is what I'm trying to get across. And if we look at things from that perspective, rather than from the perspective of trying to get even and, and trying to, 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 
avenge ourselves and that type of thing, but just looking at it from the perspective of love. Okay, what's going to be better for them and that, that I love them? Well, you don't have to worry. You just follow love and it'll lead you straight. Because love fulfills the law. And I'll tell you, it's really not hard to love one another when we look at things spiritually speaking. You know, we all don't have to agree on everything to love one another. We don't all have to think exactly the same for us to love one another. I mean, we don't have to all be carbon copies of one another. We can, again, you can get to the place where you may not necessarily like someone. They may not be, it may be, I tell you, there's certain people that are, it's better for me to just not be around. Because not because I don't like them, but I don't like who I am when I'm with them. But I can still love them and try to do what's best for them. I don't have to be ugly to them concerning that. And so we need to consider the idea of love. And even, not just good for our neighbor, but even considering these, these rulers and magistrates back in that idea, if we could for a moment realize that if something don't change, most of these magistrates and most of these men in power in America, talking about our national government, if something doesn't change, most of them, if not all of them, are in very spiritual danger, great danger. So we need to be reminded of that. Verse 10, he says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love is never going to lead you to do something ugly to somebody. So love is always a place of assurity. And that we can do something in love and follow in love and it, it'll work out. It'll be right. Verse 11, again, he changes the idea again from being tra transformed in mind concerning our neighbors to being transformed in mind concerning our day-to-day -day life. Or the specific time that we live in. Looking at the here and now. And there's, you know, nothing wrong with planning ahead. Sometimes it's, the, the Scripture in fact tells us that it's wise and prudent to do that. But we can't live our whole lives in the future. We are to live one day at a time. In the reality that at any moment Jesus Christ could come back. At any moment. Now, you know, you look at the Scripture, and from what I could see, the next event that's going to take place from a scriptural point of view is Jesus Christ is going to come back. And Paul is even so minded, as you begin to look at the way Paul is writing, that it would seem as if Paul is waiting on Christ at this very moment. That Paul is looking for Jesus in his day. And I, you, you look at the way he words things. I mean, Paul would say that not when I die and, you know, out in the future somewhere when Jesus comes back. He said, no, those of us that are alive and remain. I think Paul was waiting on Jesus to come back thinking that he would be alive when he did. That, that, all of that to say this, that Jesus could come back today and we need to be living our lives with that in view. And he says in that verse 11, and that knowing the time. Well, what, what time is he talking about? Knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now, the time tells us that it's time to wake up. He's not saying that this is the time. What he's saying, the time is that for now our salvation is nearer than we be believed. In other words, it's getting close to the time that Jesus is coming back. And it's closer today than it was yesterday. And the time is that we're in the last days. And that we're in the last of the last days here. And we need to be looking for the coming of Jesus. And if we live our lives that day, uh, that way rather, with that type of mind, we're going to be way more minded about our brothers and our sisters and about our neighbors concerning their relationship in Jesus Christ. Because everything is in view of the fact that Jesus is supposed to come back in the clouds. 
And it's so easy for us to get in the day-to-day grind that what we do is we find ourselves in chambering and wantonness, not necessarily in drunkenness, it shouldn't be the case, but living life to please ourselves. And so he says that the night is far spent. The day is at hand. In other words, it's the sun. It's going to be coming up. Jesus is about to come back. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now, this, this, all of this to, is he's, he's not saying that we need to by our own will change, excuse me, change ourselves some way, but that we've got to learn to think different. He, he repeats this in a moment. He says, so verse 13, let us walk honestly. Live a life of honesty and integrity as if we lived in the day and we didn't live in a world of sinners and a world of evil all around us. But live honestly, with integrity, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering. The idea of chambering is just laying in the bed all day. And I think it's more than the idea of just being lazy concerning work, but being lazy concerning the Lord's work. The Lord's got something for us to do. And the Lord's got, uh, 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 there's a world of people that are dying and going to hell. And meanwhile, what are we doing? Say, well, you know, I would... Get out and tell somebody about the Lord if I ever had time. You know, we've got time for what we make time for. We've got just as much time as we can make time. And if it's important enough, you'll make time for it. It just needs to become more important to us. And if we could get in our minds and live in light of the fact, in true view of Jesus, returning very soon. And we're going to have a whole lot greater burden and see a whole lot more. What's the word I'm looking for? Seriousness, maybe, concerning the time that we live in and getting people to the Lord. He goes on to say, not in just in chambering, in wantonness, which is just filling ourselves, you know, just getting the desires of our heart. All we're concerned about is what I want in life. Not in strife or in envy. He says, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's not some physical act. Sometimes we get to the place that we hear it so many times, we almost, it almost loses its meaning. He's talking about putting on the mind of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you. We're transforming our minds, remember. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. It goes on to tell us about the crucifixion of Jesus, that Jesus was so concerned about people that he could care less about what this world had to offer in the things of this world. He was concerned about the people of this world, knowing the seriousness and the severity and the stakes, if you will, of what was going on around him. He says, and make no provision the flesh so well, how, how much does God truly expect me to be transformed in mind completely and the goal is to be transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ which we'll find out to begin to think like him and that's not just what would be good for some folks and you know, we're thankful for those that get way out there and all that. That's what God expects from you. That's what God expects from all of us. That's our reasonable service, is to be transformed into the mind of Jesus Christ, to leave the ideas of society and quit living life based on what society tells us, but live our lives based on the Word of God and based here. And there's a lot of things in the Bible that we fail and we miss because we're not 
thinking right enough to even see it. And there are so many times I look back at the Scripture and I say, that's what that means. I couldn't get it earlier because I wasn't in a position grown enough in here to understand it. And a lot of times we say, could God really expect that? And yeah, God expects that. We can't understand it because we're not grown to a place. We're not minded enough to understand what that means. We need to be transformed at mind. And that begins by a hunger of God's Word and a hunger to be right with Him and to know Him and to read His Word and to put on the mind of Christ. And they, I believe with all my heart that if we could be transformed at mind, if we could be transformed into thinking like Jesus Christ as a church, there would be no end for us and the work that we would have to do and the fruit that would be born as a, as a means of our work. Today, let's be transformed in mind as what we have a verse of a song.